I'm going to go down a little bit of a different route from what you were used to seeing in the molten salt reactor community. I decided that the best way to go to get the most flexibility and most safely and get something done today is actually to build a fast reactor rather than a thermal molten salt reactor. My name is Ed File. I have 32 years of experience operating, designing, startup testing, doing maintenance on reactors. I'm Chief Technology Officer and co-founder at Elysium Industries. Our base plant is 1,000 megawatts electric, 40% efficiency approximately. I don't really believe in the small plant, low cost. We have nuclear plants that are shutting down. We need capacity. Like New Scale is operating at 29% efficiency. New nuclear plants are 35% efficiency. How can you justify that that's going to be cheaper in the long run? The plants that are being shut down are the single plants that are low power on their own. So how can you say that small plants are going to be cost effective on an operational basis? They're not. Right? The, the, the cost of construction per megawatt electric of a small plant is much higher than a large plant. We use a chloride fuel salt and a fast spectrum reactor. What it allows you to do is get to fuel flexibility. Just about any fuel that you can imagine. Spent nuclear fuel, low enriched uranium, high enriched uranium, waste navy fuel, plutonium, depleted uranium, thorium, uh, any fuel. And we consume it basically to 100%. Existing water reactors burn 4%. If you burn the other 96%, that's a factor of 24 times as much energy left in that spent nuclear fuel. We're 25% more efficient because we're 600C instead of 300C, right? So that's 30 times as much just in the spent nuclear fuel. And there's 10 times as much depleted uranium already mined out there. So 30 times the existing plant life for spent nuclear fuel is about 2,000 years worth of fuel just for the spent fuel. And if you include the DU that's already been mined, that's 10 times that. We looked at both thermal molten salt reactors and fast molten salt reactors. The problem that we had with thermal molten salt reactors is the, the lifetime of the moderator was very short and you had to replace it every four years or every eight years. And it trapped fission products because so it became a radioactive waste. Right. The other difficulty with the, the moderators is it was hard to guarantee in all situations for max power, transient power, casualty conditions that you had a negative temperature coefficient. The graphite moderator actually shrinks and swells with the irradiation. So that made it even harder to guarantee that you had a negative temperature coefficient. We don't have the thermal expansion of graphite with temperature or the expansion and contraction of graphite over lifetime with irradiation to account for in our temperature coefficients and our void coefficients. We just have a liquid core. There's just a, there's just a can full of a liquid that's enough to go critical at a certain temperature. And that's it. And so that's, that pretty much guarantees you have a negative temperature coefficient under, under all conditions. Our core outlet temperature is 600 degrees C approximately, and our return temperature is 500 degrees C. The reason why we have low temperatures compared to other designs for the molten salt is we want to build one soon, so we need to use existing qualified materials. And that's that why we drop the temperature. We can still design a reactor at that temperature. One of the benefits of the chloride salts is it has a lower melting point than the same components of a molten fluoride reactor. So that allows us more temperature margin to be able to operate at a slightly lower temperature and get materials. This is kind of key. We are using existing nuclear qualified materials in our reactor. We are not going for something that is not already nuclear qualified. There is a lot of work to be done to get to Hasloy to get the nuclear qualification. It might have ASME qualification, but I'm not sure if it's the actual grade that you would actually use or if it fits it within that grade specification. My question is, they've been tweaked and whether that's an ASME or whether the, the, the composition is broad enough to accept it. And at this point, we don't want to have a power system that is developmental. We're not doing supercritical CO2 unless it's actually been proven to be both doable, which it's not yet, and reliable. Could be supercritical steam too. The problem with supercritical steam is it increases the cost of the power plant but in, in a coal plant, they would go to supercritical steam because it saves them on fuel. Our fuel doesn't really cost anything, so I'm not sure we can justify the supercritical steam. 
if there is a power system that's not developmental, that's economic for us, by the time we get our reactor built, we will use that. But right now, we don't want to be working on qualification of a power system that could cause failure of our ability to build the reactor. We are capable of, of building a reactor anywhere from about 50 megawatts electric to 2,000 megawatts electric, two gigawatts electric. Right, that's eight loops, compact heat exchangers as you see there, eight pumps, one pump in each loop, and full flow pumps all the time. Basically, there's gonna be one large turbine or eight small turbines. That starts to sound like New Scale, right? New Scale has one turbine per reactor plant. We can have one turbine per loop if we wish, right? That allows us to scale, allows, if, if the turbine, one turbine goes down, it allows you to stay up at power. If you go down to two loops, that's a quarter of the power, 250 megawatts. If you go down to two loops and half the pump flow rate and half the heat exchanger size, it's 125 megawatts. The reactor is sized for criticality. It is just barely critical all the time, right? So there's no scale up, scale down. The flow rate through it determines your power rate. A small heat exchanger and a small pump on that, you will get a low power out of it and a low delta T. If you put big heat exchangers and big pumps and remove more heat out of that, that drops the temperature going into the core and that raises the power and you get more power out of it. So the reactor core, above core materials, control systems, all of those are the same. It's the stuff that's outside of the reactor vessel that you change out for a different sized reactor. So we can, we can build the same reactor vessel for all power levels. And so we have one factory that does that. We don't have to design different sized vessels for the core. That's a, di a, a distinct advantage of putting the heat exchangers and pumps outside of the reactor vessel. It keeps the reactor vessel the same. If you were trying to do different power levels in one reactor vessel, like an integral reactor vessel, then you would need to change the size of the reactor vessel to accommodate the larger pumps and the larger heat exchangers. And we don't need to do that. We just design our reactor with enough piping penetrations with blank flanges or something that we can add additional heat exchangers and pumps onto that to upscale the reactor or to design for a different power reactor. And the tank outside of it is pretty much the same size as well. It's just a matter of how many heat exchangers and pumps do you need to put in that tank. Reactor types. The one that I've been showing is the loop plant. The pipes go out of the reactor. Most of the molten salt reactors and most of the small modular reactors use the one on the right, which is an integral plant. I like either the loop plant or the modular plant. Now, I'm dating myself here. The current definition of modular plant means you can ship it down the road. This is the original definition of modular plant, where each component is a separate module. One component is a reactor, another component is a steam generator, and another component is a pump. And they are all attached by very short pipes to the reactor vessel. So there are not long pipes in between them. All the components are mounted right off the reactor vessel and supported by the reactor vessel. That significantly reduces the volume taken up by the different components. I like the modular plant the best. That's where I prefer to head. The loop plant is the easiest one to design though, at least in the United States. Like the AP1000 is a loop the third design concept is the integral reactor, and that's the common reactor that people are talking about for small modular reactors. And a lot of the molten salt reactors are looking at the integral reactor. The problem I see with the integral plant is you can't do maintenance on it without doing an enormous amount of tear apart to get at components that are lower down. There are going to be maintenance issues. You are going to want to look in it, you're going to want to inspect it, you're going to want to replace components. If you have an integral reactor and you need to replace a component low in the core, for instance, on a thermal reactor, if you have to replace the graphite, you have to remove the control mechanisms, the heat exchangers, the pumps, all of that to replace the graphite in the core region. So instead, if you build a modular reactor, for instance, the control mechanisms are above the core, you have direct access to those, you lift the control mechanisms off, you have access to the core region. If you want to work on the heat exchangers, they are also accessible from the top and the pumps are also accessible from the top. So you don't need to remove a whole bunch of other components to access and replace any one component. That is a dramatic improvement in maintenance costs. Fuel chloride salt chemistry. The functions of the fuel salt. 
solvent for the nuclear fuel. Fluorine molecule has a mass of 35, 37, compared to fluorine having a mass of 19. The higher the mass of the isotope in, in the fluid, the less that it moderates the neutrons. So that allows a faster spectrum. So if you have fluoride in it, it tends to moderate it and slow it down. So chlorine will be able to give you a faster spectrum. I can go to any salt mine that mines salt to put on your table, to put on as road salt, to put in your pool, and buy it by the 20 ton truckload. Two to four hundred dollars for a 20 ton truckload. As opposed to something that's very costly like lithium, and then you have to enrich the lithium to very high purity. And beryllium's a hazardous material, and so sodium chloride, you can eat it. As long as you don't have heart problems, it's very safe. We're going to end up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% heavy metal chlorides in our fuel. You need it, right? It's a fast reactor. The cross sections are lower at higher energies. So you need more fissile material. You need more fertile material to convert into fissile to get that. It's the working fluid for transporting the heat out. It needs to prevent the release of fission products. Most of the fission products, except for xenon, krypton, are chemically bound in the chloride salt. So even if you had a leak, they're chemically bound, they're not going to be released, and you leak it out, it would freeze. Uh, that's standard uh, molten salt technology. We use a chloride fuel salt and a chloride intermediate salt. One of the primary rules of design is valves leak and heat exchangers leak. So when you get a leak of the secondary salt into the fuel salt, if you have the same salt, that is not going to change the reactivity of the reactor and it's going to dilute the fuel salt. When you dilute the fuel salt, that shuts down the reactor because there's less fuel in the core at any time. You can actually recover the fuel salt. If you had different kinds of salt for primary and secondary salt, then it's going to be very difficult to separate the two salts and recover your fuel and get your reactor started back up. If you have the same salts in there, all you need to do is add additional uh, fertile and fissile and you get back to the same composition that you were at before and are able to start up the reactor. So reactor recovery from a heat exchanger leak is much easier and it's also passively safe because it shuts itself down. One of the advantages of the chloride salts is it melts at about 300 degrees C lower temperatures than fluoride salts of the same composition. And lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, I think that's only 70 degrees delta, but chloride salts are still lower. But I wanted to go to chloride salts to get that lower melting point to get away from needing highly enriched lithium, which is a proliferation problem because lithium enrichment means you get lithium-6 enrichment, which is a weapons material. So I'm trying to get away from that and the tritium. Both lithium and beryllium in a reactor will produce tritium. If I have sodium chloride, I produce hardly any tritium. Argonne National Lab, Sandia National Lab have been using chloride salts in common materials for decades. So there's a lot of experience with chloride salts in stainless steel materials. So we don't need to do additional development work in that. And that includes radioactive materials. You can get about three times as, as much actinide salt in a chloride salt that you can in a fluoride salt. And that's important because you don't want your actinides to be plating out on components aircraft reactor experiment actually had a problem with plate out of actinides or fissile materials on structural components and fissioning dumping heat in the structural components and cost them to fail. We don't want to have plate out of actinides in our reactor and the chlorides allow us to get more actinides in without being concerned about plate out of the, of the actinides. There's a lot of talk about corrosion versus water. Salts are less corrosive than water if they're pure. Hot water has a higher corrosion rate than salts. Even fluoride salts have a lower corrosion rate than hot water does. A lot of people think that, that, that salts are very corrosive because they have experience with their car corroding in the snow. The trouble with corrosion is if you have pure water, it doesn't corrode. If you put salt in that pure water, it does corrode. Same goes for the salts. If you have pure salt, no water, no oxygen in it, it does not corrode and it's less corrosive than clean water. But if you put water or oxygen in your fuel salts or your secondary salts, it will corrode. The issue is you need to keep them clean 
whether you use water or salts. But generally, water is more corrosive than fluoride salts, and fluoride salts are more corrosive than chloride salts. It's one of the other factors in allowing us to use existing standard, already qualified materials. The biggest difference between our reactors and most of the other reactors is that ours is a fast reactor and it uses a chloride salt. Fast reactors, you have much less of a problem with fission products and having to clean up the fission products to keep the reactor operating. That allows us to not have massive reprocessing systems to be able to close a fuel cycle. Massive reprocessing systems equal higher cost. When we build up fission product in our reactor, it doesn't necessarily shut our reactor down. In a thermal reactor, it, the fission product buildup shuts the reactor down fairly quickly. A fast reactor can withstand a higher fission product loading. You have more fission products in there and it makes it easier to clean fission products out if you have a higher concentration of them. So that makes our purification system simpler. We're not sensitive to the fission product content. So if our purification system for some reason needs to be shut down, we can still continue to operate the reactor. We can probably operate the reactor for decades without the purification system. It's my intent to not operate the purification system for the first 10 to 20 years at a minimum to build up the fission products to reduce the melting point of the salt. You'll notice I called it a purification system. I did not call it a reprocessing system. A reprocessing system I define as a system that separates actinides from each other and from the fission products. We do not do that. We can pull out fission products and leave the actinides behind. That means we're not pulling actinides out of the reactor as part of our waste stream. And we can do that because of the electropotential of the chloride salts. The actinides are separate from most of the fission products. Now there are some fission products that have a similar electropotential to the actinides and we won't be able to remove those. I count that as a benefit because that's like cesium and iodine. Cesium in particular reduces the melting point of the fuel salt and that's a benefit to the fuel salt. If you leave those fission products in with the actinides, you can't just walk in and pick up a fuel cell because the radiation levels coming off of it would kill anybody that tried to, to steal it. In any larger package, you would need cranes and heavy equipment and trucks to be able to steal it and that makes it much harder. So the fission products make it easy to protect the actinides and the fissiles in that material. But the bottom line is we can have a purification system that does not have a proliferation concern. Our purification system removes some of the fission products and not all of them and removes none of the actinides. That means the actinides all stay together and they all have fission products still with them. So they're radioactively protected. So that essentially almost eliminates the proliferation concerns with the molten chloride fast reactor because we don't worry about counting actinides. What are the actinide ratios? How much did you remove? Did you remove any? Did somebody steal some? We don't have that concern because we don't remove actinides from our reactors. We only remove fission products. In our reactor, we essentially do a mass spec and a Raman spectroscopy and figure out whether there's any actinides in there and what level but that's least less than 1% of the actinides come out from that pulling out and that's just a process loss. And I expect to be able to get that down much lower with a few other techniques. So the uranium and plutonium, they always stay in the reactor and never come out. The waste stream comes out. We uh, actually recycle the chlorides back into the fuel manufacturing process. The fuel manufacturing process takes chlorides to convert spent nuclear fuel oxides into chloride salts in one chemical step. Right, but you need the chlorides to do that, so we might as well just recycle the chlorides out of the waste stream back into the uh, fuel manufacturer. Since the fuel manufacturing is already radioactive, the chloride's radioactive, no big deal. And oh, by the way, I have somebody that already wants to buy the zirconium off of us too. The radioactive zirconium from spent fuel. Because they can't figure out how to get it without somebody using the stuff on the inside. Planning on molten salt processing to try to extract a medical isotope like the molybdenum 99 or anything like that? It's one of the big advantages of, of only pulling out fission products. If you only pull out fission products, you can mine the isotopics and rare earths and helium gas, the xenon gas, the krypton gas, 
to your heart's content without proliferation concerns because you did not pull out the actinides that caused proliferation concerns. So yes, you can, if I pull out the soluble fission products. In other words, if there's an economic reason to build that system for the medical isotopes and stuff like that, I'll do it. All right, but I'm not going to increase the plant cost unnecessarily if I don't if I don't need to. Next, I'd like to talk about fuel cycle options. The first option is the one that everyone else is using: high assay, low enriched uranium. Uranium that's enriched to higher than today's enrichment capability of enrichment plants of five percent, but less than the limit for low enriched uranium of 20 percent. And that's what most of the advanced reactors are looking at for starting up their reactor. It's about 90% fertile, 10% fissile, between 10 and 20% enriched. Feed-in for HLEU started up reactor is about 20% enriched and that decreases with life as you burn in more plutonium. Uranium-235 is not as efficient as some of the other fissile materials. And so we need more of the more enrichment for uranium-235 than we do of say plutonium or uranium-233. But over time, we are going to be converting uranium-238 into plutonium. So we will be switching over from less efficient uranium-235 to a more efficient plutonium-239 system over time. But since we have the low efficiency uranium-235 in there, we need to continue to add uranium-235 at just under 20% enrichment for some period of time. The higher the power of the reactor, the shorter that time period will be. You will be able to use lower and lower enrichment of feed-in, three kilograms per day of feed-in material. That's fixed for all plants. That's not special for a fast reactor versus a thermal reactor. One of the disadvantages of a fast reactor is you need more fissile material to get it critical because the cross-section goes down with the increasing energy of the neutron causing the fission. So that requires us to have a high fissile inventory in our reactor. Five, maybe eight times as much fissile load to start up our reactor. The problem with the HLEU is you need to have this high enrichment. But I can't drive an enrichment facility because once I get this reactor going for a few years, I don't need the HLEU anymore. So I can't drive the long-term development costs of, a, of an enrichment facility that can go up to 20%. The second fuel cycle type that I'd like to talk about is the plutonium and spent nuclear fuel cycle. We can convert spent nuclear fuel into chloride fuel and mix it with plutonium from weapons or reactor grade plutonium. If we use weapons grade material and we mix it with spent nuclear fuel, the plutonium in the spent nuclear fuel will denature the weapons grade plutonium when you make the fuel and you also mix the fission products from the spent nuclear fuel with the weapons grade plutonium. So you actually protect the fuel immediately when you produce it and then you, when you put it in the reactor, you consume that fuel. That is our preferred fuel because it is essentially consuming existing waste. People today are spending money to store weapons grade material, reactor grade plutonium, and spent nuclear fuel. If we can take advantage of that, that reduce our cost of fuel. We don't need to pay someone to mine and enrich uranium. Start with the high assay, low enriched uranium. Starting up with plutonium means we are starting up at our steady state chemistry. Right? We don't have to worry about changing chemistry through life. That also reduces our melting point because we have the plutonium in the fission products. So it's a, a big advantage technically to start with the spent nuclear fuel and in the process we get rid of the waste as well. In the United States, we have a plutonium management disposition agreement with Russia that the United States violated by shutting down the MOX plant in Savannah River. It was supposed to convert the weapons grade plutonium into an oxide, make MOX fuel and stick it in one of the Tennessee Valley Authority reactor plants to essentially dilute the plutonium by converting some of the plutonium-239 into plutonium-240 and make a little bit of energy out of that. That was supposed to consume 34 tons of weapons grade plutonium. We can put that in our reactor. The 34 tons will start approximately four of our reactors and it will be denatured just by mixing it with the spent nuclear fuel. There's also a total of 53 tons excess weapons grade plutonium as defined by the DOD and the DOE. That 53 tons will start up seven of our reactors instead of just the four for the PMDA agreement. The United Kingdom has excess plutonium they'd like to get rid of. That helps us start up reactors. 
France, they do do reprocessing. They make mock fuel and reuse it, but they can only reuse it once. After that, there's too many higher actinides in the thermal spectrum. The twice burned fuel, the MOX fuel, is essentially fuel for us, and we can use that. Japan is shutting down their reprocessing facility. They have an enormous amount of reactor grade plutonium that they have reprocessed, intending to be made into MOX and put back into the reactors. So we could take that. It's basically a megatons to megawatts program for plutonium, just like we did for uranium. The next fuel cycle I'd like to talk about is the uranium-233 thorium cycle. There are two ways this can be used in our reactor. If you try to run on a pure uranium-233 cycle in the core as a single fluid reactor or a two fluid reactor with a blanket, the advantage of the fast spectrum is the number of neutrons per fission is about 2.5 neutrons versus about 2.3 neutrons for a thermal spectrum. So you need one neutron per fission, you need one neutron per conversion. That means you have 0.3 neutrons for absorption in the coolant, absorption in fission products, leakage out of the reactor, control, all those things. That is very marginal. On the right where we're operating, the fast spectrum is way higher than the number of neutrons per fission in the thermal spectrum. That makes the neutronics much easier to account for leakage, absorptions, poisons, or fission products in the coolant. So I can actually run this reactor on a fast spectrum burning uranium-233 and thorium. The other thing I can do is I can start it off on plutonium and uranium and breed thorium into 233 in a blanket. You get the advantage that the thorium is going to be a better fissile material than uranium-235 and you consume the, the thorium and you have a lower actinide load in the core at any one time from that and you can consume thorium as a fuel. If you look at the two red lines on the first curve, that's the fission cross sections. Yes, in a fast reactor, you have low th fission cross sections, but the reason why this curve is on there is it also has the uranium-238 and the thorium-232 fission cross sections. So you notice in a fast reactor, which is to the right of that red line is where we're operating, those two cross sections come up and for uranium-238, we get about 10% fissions. For thorium, we get about 5% fissions. That's like having a few extra few free neutrons. So it's like a, instead of 2.9 neutrons per fission, it's 3.1 neutrons per fission. In the pure thorium cycle, instead of getting 2.5 neutrons per fission for thorium-233 in the fast spectrum, you get about 2.6 neutrons per fission because you get about 5% of your fissions from fissioning thorium-232 directly. A little advantages, but they all add up in the long run to extra neutrons. In a thermal spectrum, the protactinium-233 that is created from the thorium-232 will absorb a neutron. That loss means you're converting the uranium-233 to uranium-234, which is not fissile. You lost that neutron that you used, plus you need another neutron to convert it into uranium-235. And so that hurts your neutron economy. So in a thermal reactor, you need to remove the protactinium-233 from the neutrons or have an enormous volume of it to prevent it having to be near the neutron source as long to be able to make your neutronics work. Separation of protactinium is a problem. If you take protactinium out of the reactor, wait seven days and strip all the uranium out from the protactinium, right, you are essentially pulling all of the uranium-232 out. Let it sit for another seven days or a month to let protactinium-233 decay, which has a 27-day half-life, so you can let it go several months. The stuff that's removed after that is essentially pure uranium-233 weapons-grade material. That is a very easy, non-chemistry, just time-differentiated way of making weapons-grade uranium out of the protactinium that has to be separated to be able to meet the neutronics requirements to do uranium-233 and thorium in a thermal spectrum. In a fast spectrum reactor, you don't necessarily need to use a pure thorium cycle. You can use mixed uranium-238 cycle with the thorium. The thorium creates uranium-233, uranium-232, but it also has uranium-238 in it. And the uranium-238 denatures the uranium-233 and protects it from a proliferation perspective. If you do it with single fluid, you also have the fission products in with it. And you can do that because plutonium is very efficient. 
So if you burn the two, uranium and thorium together with a plutonium fuel and a uranium-233 mixed fuel, you can still consume thorium and in a proliferation safe manner. As far as the flexibility of the fuel system, you can use thorium, you can use plutonium, you can use uranium-235, uranium-238. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You can make them work. Plutonium is the most efficient fuel for operating a fast spectrum reactor, but a fast spectrum reactor is more efficient for using thorium than a thermal spectrum molten salt reactor is because of the extra neutrons that you have. It means maybe you don't have to run as complex a purification system and you can reduce the cost of the purification system because you have fast spectrum, because you have 60% extra neutrons to accommodate so you don't have to clean up this, the fission products quite as much. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the conversion process of our fuel. We take the spent nuclear fuel and we chop it up into two centimeter pieces. We don't extract the uh, uranium oxide and fission products from in the zircaloid tubes. We actually want the zircaloid tubes in there. We melt our carrier salt, sodium chloride, in excess of its melting point, and we add another fuel salt component to that, aggressive towards oxides. Then pour spent nuclear fuel segments into the salt pot, and they react out to convert the oxides in the fuel, the uranium, the plutonium, the fission products, into chlorides. The oxides become particulates. The noble metals precipitate out as particulates. They're solids and the gases bubble off. So we filter that material off and that is our fuel. So that's a single chemistry process step. That keeps all the transuranics, the plutonium and uranium and the fission products all together in our fuel so there's not a proliferation concern. We take that fuel salt and it's ready to be poured into our reactor. So you'll notice I said there's one chemical step in sure. doing that, right? Sure. The pyroprocessing stuff that Argonne National Lab did, the stuff had seven chemical steps to do what they did. The first thing they do was separate, they oxidize it um, into uh, U308, and then they uh, um, separate out the uranium, and then they separate out plutonium with a few of the fission products, and then there's a couple of other steps for processing. I have one, chem one chemical process to get our fuel. Because our fuel's a liquid. I don't have to handle it to manufacture solid fuel. That's a dramatic savings in cost. Very simple fuel production process. We are working with Idaho National Lab and Argonne National Lab to actually test the fuel conversion, essentially proving that we can convert our spent nuclear fuel into our fuel in this process because we are not separating uranium, plutonium, or fission products from each other. So I call it conversion, not processing, because processing is essentially separation of different materials, and we don't do that. And this is a low cost thing, so we can afford to do this uh, for the fuel. The process that we're using is an existing hot cell that was developed for testing the pyroprocessing of spent nuclear fuel into new MOX fuel for the FFTF, IFR, or the PRISM reactor. We're just using a pot for doing that, but we're not doing any of the successive steps that separate anything. This is not proprietary work. This was developed actually in Japan, right? So it's not U.S. proprietary. Therefore, it's not special technology in the United States. The technology in Japan was published, so it is open to the entire world. This material, in my mind, is not considered pyroprocessing and should be published. DOE gain, generally, they have a requirement to publish everything that they do. The question here is, if this is considered pyroprocessing or reprocessing of any manner, it will be essentially classified and not published. And we don't actually want that. We want anyone to be able to use this. We would like anyone that has a fast reactor or a chloride reactor to essentially be able to consume spent nuclear fuel because consuming spent fuel and weapons material is a good thing for the entire country. Notional and only notional molten chloride salt fast reactor two. Passive safety, pumps without electricity. I figured that out how to do that. Haven't done the development. Pumped draining, which means not a free seal and a pump that doesn't need electricity to run and drain faster than a free seal, which is the same thing. I've identified that. This was written earlier. This was just, a, a, shall we say, two typos or three typos in a posting and stuff. Allothanium and stuff, we want to use everything. <laughs> and we can use everything.
Uh, we don't want to discharge fuel. We want to minimize proliferations. We want to get to 1300C or 2400F, which is, gives us 60% efficiency in just about any process heat temperature, any process you want. 1300C is, concrete is made at 1400C. We can get the heat up to 1300C and then you use electric heat to get to 1400C to do concrete. The last one is don't shut down in a natural disaster. Reactors aren't the problem. It's not danger, right? The danger is people not getting medical care because they don't have electricity. I'll skip the summary because I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. Um, I have worked designing reactors for the Navy for 32 years. A lot of my team has followed me out of the Naval Reactors Program, and so we have over 300 years of design experience in our team of actually designing, building, operating, testing, maintaining reactor systems. Um, so when you talk about real experience designing and operating reactors, our team has that in spades. Because everybody wants to work on advanced reactors and they followed me out of the Naval Nuclear Lab to work on an advanced reactor because that's exciting. And so that's how we developed the team. They saw that I was doing something exciting and they followed me.